Tawfiq Rahim. Welcome to Tunisia. Thank you very much. Who are you, Tawfiq? We don't know you. Well, what can I tell you? Uh, I mean, I'm based in Dubai. Uh, I'm Canadian myself, from mixed background, uh, both educationally uh, and ethnically, you could say. Uh, my mother's from Pakistan, my father's from Uganda, but I've spent the better part of the last decade in the Arab world, which has become my adopted region. And I come from a background that mixes business, that mixes strategy, that mixes policy. I worked with the UN, I worked with McKinsey and Company, uh, and now I do policy and strategy advisory work uh, through my own firm, Globesite, in Dubai, um, but also contribute to the public debate and discourse about geopolitical trends and regional developments. And so that's, in a nutshell, who I am um, that I can explain, I guess, uh, in a short time. You're in Tunis today for the Harvard Arab Alumni Association meeting. Can you tell us about your involvement in the organization and what, why actually you chose Tunisia to come to do these kind of meetings? Well, uh, I'm an alumnus of the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard and a member of the Harvard Arab Alumni Association. Uh, and I think this is the first conference we've done and we've done uh, eight conf such conferences uh, in the Arab world. It's the first one we're doing in North Africa and obviously in Tunis. Uh, and in a post-revolution country in transition in the Arab world. I think it was incredibly important to choose such a, conference, uh, such a destination for this conference. Because Tunis, as much as the outlook is mixed in the present, it is the place where there's the potential for change, and the potential for development of ideas towards a new direction in the Arab world. And if we're going to do a conference on the future of the Arab world, on the issue of transformation, there is no place in the region to do it at this moment other than Tunis. And that's why we chose it. And I think today, because we are at the end of the conference really, the proceedings, I think we've seen that we've had a really rich and open discussion, even if there were disagreements, on so many different sectors and trends and issues. And I think so our choice has proven to be the right one for Tunis. You're based in Dubai. Uh, what an amazing place for someone who's interested in the Arab world, but who's also from a Pakistani, Ugandan descent. Um, how, would you, how would you explain uh, or how would you report on the way Pakistanis and Indians and the subcontinent region perceive the Arab Spring? Well, you know, I mean, Dubai itself, I mean, one of the most exciting parts about it is that it's global and it's open to the world. And we look at places like New York or London, uh, places where you also find a lot of people from the subcontinent over time in different migra migratory patterns participate. Uh, and you start attracting talent from all different places and having that intersection and interaction. And that's what ends up producing a lot of great ideas. Uh, Dubai has had this attraction point for the subcontinent more so than anything that the Arab Spring or Arab Awakening is doing. I think the Arab Awakening hopefully will lead to exciting cities and countries and movements and companies not the same as Dubai, in a different way exciting let's say, I mean I don't think any models are the same, that can then attract global talent, global uh, energy to be coming to places like Tunisia and Egypt and interacting and creating really the ideas that lead change in the region and the world. You look at any country that's taken a step change, whether it's South Korea or Singapore or Malaysia, and you go up and down the list of these countries, they've all attracted global talent and global ideas. And I think for anybody from the subcontinent or East Africa for that matter, it's no different. And they're much more intrigued, to be honest, by the model in Dubai and the developments there than anything really the Arab Awakening is uh, doing because that process still has to play out. Other than for that momentary fascination in the first few months, it really was, it really has been a wait and see approach. Um, the connection we have with East Africa and with the subcontinent is also through Islam. Yes. And Islam currently is facing I would say a crucial uh, period in its history. Uh, different movements uh, are taking, really trying to kind of 
take as much as they can of the identity of the Muslims and influence the different mazahib and the different school of thoughts. Um, if you want to explain this kind of, uh, I don't want to say debate because it also includes some violence, uh, to someone who's really just starting to be interested in the topic, how do you summarize the situation in the Islamic world right now? Well, the first thing that we have to understand, I think, uh, and especially for someone who's a beginner in looking at what is the Islamic world and what is Islam, is that it's a very diverse religion and it's a very diverse population in terms of the global Muslim population. We refer to the global Muslim population as the Ummah, the Ummah being the Islamic nation. And that is a nation of 1.4 billion people. But there are 1.4 billion people spread across over 60 countries, uh, approximately of those who are somewhat Muslim majority or Muslim plurality countries, but minorities in almost every country in the globe. And so you have African Islam, and you have South Asian Islam, and you have Southeast Asian Islam, and you have Arab Islam, and you have Persian Islam. So the first step is to understand things that like only 20% of the global Muslim population is Arab, for example. The most populous Muslim country in the world is Indonesia. The second thing to understand is that Islam is not so much in crisis as it is existing in many countries undergoing historical, political and social transitions. And that's what we're seeing in these symptoms of turmoil. And sometimes they coalesce under this collective banner of Islam that many of the movements in these regions collect and they become a movement that then has roots in Al-Qaeda so you'll have a localized fight, for example, in Mali, but with international elements because there is this common thread of faith. But it plays on local circumstances almost in every occasion. We then have to have a third analysis and say, well, in each of these environments, what is the dynamic that's shifting? And there's multiple dynamics that are shifting across all these diverse populations. For example, within Tunisia, you now have a situation where you're having a new discussion about the accommodation between secularists and Islamists. Not atheists, secularists and Islamists. And mind having a discussion, which would happen later on in the day, about people who are atheists and, non -re and religious. So those are discussions that are going ongoing. Then you have people who are using the form of political Islam to discuss a political agenda. For example, in Syria, you're talking about jihad and the use of jihad in the fight in Syria. And that's a discussion. So we have many di dimensions and dynamics that are ongoing, which makes it even more difficult for a beginner to understand. One approach can be to start differentiating between different mazhab, as you call mazahib, the sects in Islam, and getting into looking at the issues of sectarianism, for example, uh, between Shias and Sunnis. But then understanding, laying, putting a layer of diversity on that group and saying, well, who are the different Muslims beyond that? Because, for example, once we go inside the Shia Islam, we know that, yes, there are 12 uh, Shia Muslims, Ishnashri. We know that there are Zaydi Shia Muslims who are in Yemen, for example. We know that there are Ismaili Shia Muslims who are in, for example, in different forms in Saudi Arabia and South Asia and in Syria and Iran and other places. We know that there is the Alawi group, which is an offshoot of Shia Islam. We know that there are Sunni Muslims, for example, but in the Sunni Islam, you have four principal mazhab or, or schools of jurisprudence. We know that within all the schools of jurisprudence, that there's a partaking for some of them inside Sufi orders or more esoterically minded orders. And, so, and then there's even a number of other things. So really the approach to Islam has to be very diligent, very deliberate, looking at all these differences and nuances to really start understanding. Sorry, there was a long answer. That's, that's okay. Yeah. That actually opens uh, the door for my, my other question. So we're seeing an attack against Sufi Islam. Yes. We're seeing shrines attacked in Libya, in Tunisia, in Tambuktu. Uh, why is this happening? Who's behind this? Well, this is, I think, not a surprise. And people who are surprised uh, should go back and read history of Islam and Islamic movements and politicized Islamic movements and funding of Islamic movements in the last uh, half century. What we've seen, and some of it has originated from the Gulf, uh, I think to a significant degree, 
And a lot of it is about the convergence of multiple trends within Egypt, within Afghanistan, in other environments, which have started to promote a very insular neo-fundamentalism, a neo-Puritan puritanical approach to the religion. Normally when we think about fundamentalism, we say you're going back to the foundations. But we've seen a redefinition of those foundations. Because in the foundations of Islam, there was an embracing of the other because Islam actually started in a pluralistic environment. And in many of the countries that it went to, whether it was Palestine or regions it went to, Palestine, Egypt, and elsewhere, there was a number of Christians and Jews who lived there. When it went to India, for example, there was a number of Hindus who lived there. There were Buddhists that were encountered. And so Islamic empires over time made accommodations for pluralism, which is why you have the system, the millet system in the Ottoman Empire. What has happened in the last half century, and you can point to the situation with Sayyid Qutb, for example, in Egypt, one of the leaders of the Muslim Brotherhood. When he was in jail, he wrote uh, a number of books, one called uh, Signposts uh, on the Road, in which they talk about the rejection of even the fellow Muslim. And they hearken back to a scholar uh, about a thousand years ago named Ibn Taymiyyah in Syria, who was jailed when the Mongols came through the Arab world. And the Mongols converted to Islam. So normally you cannot take a jihad and violence against fellow Muslims. But Ibn Taymiyyah surmised, he said, well, these people are munafiq, they're hypocrites, and they're mushriks, they're, they're people who've committed the greatest sin in Islam. So we can actually consider them becoming non-Muslims. It's a form of takfir or making the other into the kafir, the unbeliever, and then you can undertake jihad against them. And that's in the political environment. And that's how that started in, let's say, the 60s. And it transmorphed into Al-Qaeda in the modern world after the Afghanistan Jihad as a play to against contemporary Arab regimes. So you had the Gamal Islamiya led uh, in part by Ayman al-Zawahiri who became the number two in Al-Qaeda in the 80s against the Egyptian regime. And you had a number of movements like in Algeria. And then, of course, the genesis of Al-Qaeda, which initially was against Saudi Arabia in, in Bin Laden's view when they engaged the West. But then what's happened in recent times is the transfer of this thought from the political arena to the societal arena, where you are now a target not just because you're politically a regime that's being declared Muslim, but you're a person or a community that's being declared a non-Muslim. And you are a threat to the integrity of the society. And that's where the Sufis come in. Because the Sufis get labeled as people who commit sharh, people who commit the association of a partner with God. That's what shark is. You're putting a sharik with God. You're putting a partner with God. And you're undermining what in Islam is a central principle. is Tawheed. To be a Muslim, every Muslim must say, La ilaha illallah wa Muhammadur Rasulullah. There is no God but God. And the Prophet is his messenger. The first part of that is saying there's only one God. And when you're a Sufi and you're paying reverence to a murshid or your guide or a saint who's passed away at the shrine, you're putting someone at the level of God in the minds of the fundamentalists or the neo-fundamentalists. And by virtue of doing that, you're con committing shirk. And by virtue of that, you can be called a kafir. You are being takfeered, essentially. And if you're a kafir, then I can wage jihad against you. And I will wage jihad against you because you're threatening our societal integrity. Now, ultimately, you have people who are neo-fundamentalists inside the U.S., the Amish, for example. They live their ascetic lives and don't disturb anyone. And what has happened in the Muslim world is these ascetic people, these puritanical people, have become activists. And the vehicle for their activism to generate support, to generate political support, is to target these other communities. Because as we always know, either foreign or domestic, the targeting of the other is the best way for a political force to gain strength. And the last point I will make is that these political forces are augmented by support, sometimes by individuals and institutions in other parts of the world, and often in the Gulf, and sometimes Saudi Arabia. And we must not forget that when the House of Saud took over in the third Saudi state in the 1920s in the alliance with the Wahhabis, Saudi Arabia, one of the first things they did was destroy all the Sufi shrines, of which there were many, inside Saudi Arabia. So why are we surprised? We shouldn't be.